Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I haven't seen you all for a while. I know, you're like, who is this new person up here? Well, welcome to worship this morning at the First Presbyterian Church of Everett. Uh, my name's Alan Dorway, and I am back from a sabbatical and, and usually the pastor around here. So it's good to see familiar and new faces in worship this morning. We're also grateful for those who are joining with us online. Um, there are a lot of things going on, a lot of things happening here at our congregation. I just want to celebrate that uh, the donations to the Volunteers of America Food Bank have continued this summer and this past week. We donated 336 pounds, and that's awesome. Thank you for that donation that helps food insecure families here in our area. And uh, the next food collection is on October 2nd on Communion Sunday. There's going to be a couple of different changes. Uh, Thursday Bible studies with me are going to continue, but they're going to resume on uh, Thursday, September 22nd at 4 o'clock. Grateful for Shirley uh, Solberg and the study on 1 Corinthians over the summer. A lunch with Pastor Allen is going to be moving to a new day. We're going to move to Mondays at noon, and uh, we're going to begin that again on the 26th, and we're going to try to do that in person in the library. So if you're interested in coming and hanging out with me and having lunch and bringing your own brown bag lunch and talking, I invite you to do that on uh, Monday, September 26th. Priscilla Circle begins their fall exploration tomorrow, September 12th, Monday at 1130 in the Calvin Lounge. Presbyterian women are having a kickoff on the 17th. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet at the welcome booth outside, or you can talk with uh, one of the women on the Presbyterian board. Um, Presbyterian Women uh, Dorcas Circle is talking and thinking about reforming, and if you're interested in that, please talk with Debbie Roberts or Leslie Sutton, or ask for more information as well there. Uh, our church is hosting the Poverty 101 through the Everett Gospel Mission on October 1st. There's a couple of spots still left open. Uh, that's going to be a really uh, a opportunity for us to learn, to grow, to experience, to challenge ourselves on how we view poverty in our area. It's a, it's a class that the Gospel Mission has been putting on for about three years now. It's wonderful. And uh, I've signed up. A couple other people in the congregation have signed up. Use the links there or talk with uh, Judy uh, Hammond or John Gebbard about this opportunity. I'm going to invite Steve Torrance to come and share about a very exciting thing taking place right here this afternoon. We've actually already mentioned it, and that's the summer air concert, which will be here at three today. But the really reason that I came up is I'm, I'm asking for help when the service is over, because that beast needs to be moved. Now, you'll, I'll have you know I brought some sliders so that they'll be able to slide all the way back to the back of the church this time instead of us having to carry them. So that will hopefully help. But again, you're more than welcome to come, and uh, hopefully you'll look forward to the concert, and we'll, hopefully I'll look forward to a little help after church. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. So Steve is being a little, uh, a little modest. We are excited that our summer... One of our uh, sort of special summer choir pr productions is called Summer Air. It's this afternoon at 3 p.m. We hope you can join us. And then there's ice cream afterwards. So, you know, not only do you hear some wonderful music and show tunes and hear a choir and some wonderful gifted vocalists, but you can also hang out with some ice cream afterwards. So we hope you join us at 3 o'clock. Next Sunday, we have worship at 10 a.m. It's a hybrid, so there's obviously uh, those can join us online, or we're grateful that you're here in person. We um, have coffee time after worship. We hope you join us. And there is Sunday school at 1130 in Calvin Lounge as well, led by Steve Hammond after worship. But as we're, as we're all joining, as this is the beginning of a new fall, uh, I'm just going to ask us, let's stand and greet each other. Stan, we haven't done this in a while. If you don't want to shake hands, that's cool too. Uh, just greet each other in the warmth of Christ. Say hello. Give a fist bump. Say hello. It's great to see people. Feel free not to...
It's wonderful to hear everyone welcoming each other. Let us remain standing. Let us remain standing and join with me if you're able in the call to worship this morning. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 95. For, let us join together. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Please be seated. So yes, as you probably noticed, uh, not only, I mean, I did come back. I seem to like whenever I go and come back, you know, now I, I shaved off my beard. But I'm sure most of you recognize I'm wearing flip-flops <laughs> and my shirt's untucked. And I'm going to tell you why as the, as the sermon goes along, but I'm just going to tell you this This unique thing about flip-flops, and that is uh, we were visiting Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. We were doing a college tour, Vicki, Peyton, and I, and we were there on this college tour, and you go and you have an introduction. We sat with that, and then we were divided out into these groups with an enthusiastic guide to begin a walking tour, and I noticed everyone in the group was wearing shoes, but not me. Because flip-flops are the official shoes of summer. And it's California. I wasn't worried. I like walking around in flip-flops, and we began. However, it was not more than 15 minutes into the tour, and I realized I didn't put sunscreen on my feet. And they were fried. I couldn't do anything about it. I was like, well, they're burnt. All right, here we go. So we, we had this one place where we stopped listening to this uh, tour guide. She was wonderful. I sort of stood a little bit farther away trying to put my feet in the shade. 
And Vicky comes over and she goes, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I was like, uh, my feet are burned. And I was just trying to get some relief uh, without drawing so much attention to myself. Um, you know, this didn't mean that I had a great base layer for later and everything's fine. But, you know, uh, right there and there, it was really painful. And when we join in a time of confession, we take time to pray, we may look around and think, I'm good. I got this. It's time of confession in church. I just need to be polite and we'll get to the Lord's Prayer. You know, we've all had good weeks. You know, we're good people. And yes, there are things that we need to pray about. But sometimes the thought of just confessing is overwhelming. I, I got it, though, which is great. However, there are times when we pray that we realize that part of our soul, maybe a little bit of our heart, it's exposed, it hurts. We feel a pain, a hurt that might not have been there 15 minutes ago all of a sudden rises up and we go, oh my goodness, I have guilt. I've thought about this. I need to lift this up. Maybe something that we participated in or said or had done to us floats to our minds. We feel that burn of unresolved anger or shame. And this part of our prayers in that time, those spots need our care. And sometimes that happens during confession. And so I invite us during the silent part of our prayer, if those moments comes up, if, if those situations, those feelings, those concerns that arise that are painful, during those times of silence, we just bring those to Jesus. He wants to care for us. He wants us to unburden ourselves to him. He wants to offer us relief and mercy and understanding with his grace. So yes, we understand. Sometimes we get confession. We understand what's happening. We note our failings and we come to Jesus. And other times we go, hey, we got this. But we might experience a little bit of burn that needs to come up. We need to lift up to Jesus. So let's open our hearts. And maybe this morning allow those places we did not expect to come into the Spirit's loving care. Let us take a moment in prayer. Lord of all, this morning we come to you as we are. There have been moments this past week that have been awesome. There have been other times that have not been as good. We have both rested in your love and we have rushed ahead. We have followed you and at the same time we have taken situations into our own hands that have hurt others. We note that this past week, we too have been let down. We've also ignored your will for the immediate benefit of what we thought was right. Lord, effectively, we have sinned. We have taken control of our lives. We have ignored who you are. And yet you still love us as we are. Whatever is going on in our hearts, Lord Jesus, you know. You know our hopes and our joys, the concerns that trouble us the pain that we may try to push down. And in this moment, as we pray, we open this space in our hearts to you. We humbly ask that you would take the sin, the hurt, the needless burden, the shame away from us. We do not have to say any special words or participate in an elaborate ritual. All we need to do is let you in. We ask for your grace to clean and redeem our hearts so that we could once again know the joy and love of your salvation. We ask to lean on your truth so we can let those competing and misplaced lies that battle for our allegiance, we can let those go. We humbly ask that you set us free from the blinders that steer us away from your leading and allow us to seek you even more as you call us to follow you in faith. Lord, hear our hearts now as we take a moment in silence.
You know our hearts, Lord. And we're grateful for that. And so we ask that you would hear our prayers for our world. That you would hear our prayers for our nation. And that as we pray for our community, that this morning that you would specifically be with our students, our teachers, the paraeducators, families, and administrators as school continues this week. We thank you, Jesus, for your mercy and forgiveness and grace. It is through your amazing love that we are able to pray in unity the prayer that you taught us as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're standing on the steps today because we have no chairs. So, however, we will have chairs here next Sunday. And for those of you who feel that you'd like to sing with a choir, we'd be happy to see you here as well at about 8.45 next week. So, we're already starting to work on cantata for Christmas. And so, I know that Christmas comes early, but uh, nevertheless. So... And by the way, we did, with Alan here, we had to sing his favorite song first.
Thank you, choir. For those who, who, who don't know, even though it's uh, quite apparent, that, that's my favorite hymn. And so the, Steve and others are always generous in giving us new and uh, good arrangements to listen to those powerful and timeless words. So beginning next week, um, I invite you to bring your own Bible to worship. I know some of you do, and uh, we are blessed with um, great pew Bibles and resources at times in our pews. But um, our, our theme this year, from a stewardship, but also from a uh, sort of like a little bit of a just weaving in throughout the, the season, has been read, pray, and love. And we're going to be diving into the read portion of that uh, in between now and Thanksgiving. And so part of the reading process is read scripture. And so uh, I, I invite you, if you're able, or, or reminding, I, you know, you don't, you can, you can obviously use pew Bibles. Um, you, I think it's always a benefit to be able to listen to someone read scripture because we might hear something new. But it's also good to bring your own Bible along because then you can make notes in it. You can highlight things. You can also then talk to me afterwards when I made a mistake. Uh, otherwise, you never know if I made a mistake, right? You know, they'd be like, let's turn to Psalm 151. And people might be like, yeah, that's great. Okay, there's only 150 Psalms currently in our canon of scripture. And, you know, trust me, that is like one thing that they, in seminary, they throw out there just to see if anyone gets like an intro to a new t intro to, to scriptural studies. Every once in a while, they just throw that in there and see if anybody turns to 151. Now, in the Apocrypha, yes, in the Apocrypha, I know some scholars are out there, they're like, there is a 151 in the Apocrypha, I know, but in our current canon, I know that's all these wonderful things. But that's why bringing your own Bible or using a pew Bible helps out. So our scripture today is 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 through 17, and I printed, uh, I have it on my tablet, it's larger print, so I don't have to completely squint, but anyway, just to let you know. This is Paul writing, and Paul writes, I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, and I'm using the New Revised Standard Version. Uh, some of the versions might be a little bit different, but this is the NRSV. I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason I received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would, not, who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I am very grateful to be home. Now, primarily on my sabbatical, I was home. Uh, I was home a lot, but I deeply appreciate and want to you, you to know how blessed I am to have had the opportunity to take a sabbatical. And I will be unpacking a lot of the journey of my sabbatical over the next uh, weeks or so, but I wanted to say thank you specifically right now to Doreen, and to Sandra, Steve, and Gary, Ari, our elders and deacons, our lay leaders, and Steve and Peggy and Randy who held down the, the booth upstairs, our guest pastors, those who've worshiped with us online, those who've showed up for studies and work parties and opportunities to serve this summer, and everyone who took time to be the church. Our church is not just this building, but we are the church and Jesus is our head. And we each play a part. And when we help and when we serve and we attend and give and participate together as Christ's body here and beyond these walls, when we do this with Jesus, we are amazing. And this is what you did this past summer. You were amazing. And also, it's healthy for us to be reminded that Jesus is our head. 
I'm blessed to be called here to serve, but we all serve together as witnesses to our risen Lord. But in a nutshell, if you really want to know, I use these three months to rest and recharge. I visited my brother and his family in Sacramento. I visited friends out east in the D.C. area and then down through North Carolina. Vicki, Peyton, and I took a wonderful two-week road trip down the, uh, through Crater Lake to the California coast where we enjoyed time together. We saw friends. We had great weather. We saw the ocean. I continued my road trip to Las Vegas to see my parents before driving back up here to stopping in in Reno and Carson City to see friends. And to top it off, even though I was not 100% sure I would do it, I ran my second half marathon of the year last Sunday in the Rock and Roll Series down in Bellevue. And in between, there were plenty of house projects, a couple rounds of golf, small day trips and hikes, and in that time, I rested. And to assist with recharging, I read a lot. I took time to pray and reflect. I walked the dog. I listened to music. I cooked food. I ran. I watched lots of baseball. And yes, and I get this, this is a gift and a privilege, but I'm going to tell you a secret. There was a hard part to the sabbatical. Ironically, it was stopping. Now, prior to the summer, I worked with my counselor to review plans, setting goals, and he kept on reminding me, Alan, the first part of any Sabbath, any vacation, any beginning of a new step, and the first part of your sabbatical needs to be stopping. So many of you know this. I put a stop hold on my emails. I logged out of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I deleted apps from my phone. I created a new email address for our church Zoom account so that the church Zoom can continue without maybe being bugged on it, you know. I sent tons of emails with detailed instructions for those who were leading while I was gone. I changed the greeting on my office phone, which is a lot harder than it seems. And trust me, when you hit, re when you hit replay and you hear what you just said, you go, oh, I want to delete that and try it again. Um, I turned off notifications. I even extended the quiet time on my cell phone. And on the first day of my sabbatical, I came back to work. I came to the office. I forgot some things, right? I said, I'll just come in and be in and out. But Doreen and I started talking, and then Ray was there, and then I checked my emails just to make sure, and I'll stop on day two. And I know it sounds silly, but it wasn't until about a week after the beginning of my sabbatical when I traveled to Sacramento and Vicki reminded me, put on your flip-flops. Those are the official shoe wear of summer and chill vibes. That somehow I managed and stumbled into stop. It is hard to stop. I and mean, we joke when we get back from a time away that we need a vacation to recover from our vacation, right? I mean, we find the summer blew by. I mean, school has already started. And for those with kids in college or out of state, I mean, they've already been in there a month or more, right? I mean, all the stores have Halloween stuff on the shelves and Christmas items waiting in the wings. So, of course, we can't stop because things just keep coming. It keeps on coming. Time moves fast. And there's always one more thing to do. Or worse, we put immense pressure on ourselves to do three more things because that's what, just fill in the blank, that's what impulse courses through our veins. Or would you have this compulsion even to do more, keep moving, improve, get a handle on it, be better because when we accomplish whatever we're set out to do, that feat, when we've made it to the top, we will finally rest. We'll find some validation. We'll check off one more box. We'll finally be able to prove or justify and receive worth in this life. And God would be proud because if we just keep on doing it, time moves that way. And we go, I just got to keep on doing it. And I'm not sure if we ever get there or if we ever really stop. I mean, I know I don't. There's part of me. Maybe it's, maybe it's not you. Maybe it's just me that needs to justify my existence at times here on earth. And if I'm not doing something, then for some reason, I bought into this thought. I bought into this thought, again, if I'm not doing something if I'm not heading in some direction, if I'm not completing the task or if I'm keeping busy, then I'm failing. 
I'm lacking. And then, and then the, the, maybe this is just for me, but when I feel like I'm failing or lacking, I spiral into that I'm not lovable by God or others. And we know that we are afraid of many things. And the process of stopping or being still, it doesn't seem like we're afraid of that. But it is, and we are. Stopping is hard because it causes us to confront those lies that sneak into our heads and our hearts that we are only our accomplishments. That we're only good when we do good. That we're only worthy when we can justify our existence and we are too and we are too important without or or we are too important that things can't go on without us because it doesn't fall apart or we can do it on our own. Those lies permeate at times my heart, my mind. And sometimes when we stop, we can get afraid that someone will look back at us in the mirror that we don't know. And it's true. Sometimes we look in the mirror and we don't know who we're seeing. Paul is writing a letter to one of his disciples, Timothy. Paul's not just encouraging an up-and-coming leader of a fledgling church. He's also passing along a lifetime of experience of learning how to follow, embrace, and stop for God. Paul begins his reflections, that the verses we read, on the moment that he stopped. And if we remind ourselves a little bit about Paul, he was originally Saul. From Tarsus, he received his education uh, by, through a highly respected rabbi in Jerusalem. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he reminds us, and he vigorously set out to defend his traditions, and thus he persecuted the early church. And on a trip, remember in Acts, this is where, you know, if we had our Bibles out, we could flip to Acts chapter 9. He's on, he's on the way to persecute followers of the way in Damascus. And there along that road, he has a vision of Jesus. And it changed his life and turned him into Paul and the apostle to the Gentiles. But most importantly, this vision caused Paul to stop. It knocked him off his horse even. Paul, in his letter, is reminding Timothy and us that he was chugging along, doing all the right things, working himself up the ladder when Jesus caused him to stop. And yes, it was jarring, but it wasn't a bad thing. This experience for Paul is an act of God's mercy. And notice notice that Paul doesn't use the word conversion. He uses the word calling. That he was appointed, he was called. When, when we recall this moment in Paul's biography, we tend to imagine he was converted. He changed his religion. He was converted into Christianity. But he didn't change from one religion to another. Because at that time, there was no, there was no distinguishing between Judaism and Christianity. It was all one. If anything, Paul just went from Pharisaic changing to a messianic Christian movement. His conversion really was about being called. He stopped and was called by Jesus into a new way of being. Our verses start by noticing that Paul was called not by himself, not by his own works, but by Jesus. And we, we imagine that Paul was doing all these things before his conversion or his calling, and he just kept on doing more things. Because guess what? He was so educated, he kept on being educated. He was so scholarly, he kept on teaching theology. He was passionate, he was a worker, he was a special writer. He was his early leader in this movement that became the church. That it must have been by his works that set him apart. Jesus, sometimes we go, Jesus knew who Paul was, and it's because of who he was that he is called to be this. But the calling was Jesus himself, not Paul, but it was Jesus putting the call on Paul. Paul is highlighting that Jesus did this action. Jesus stopped him and called him to his true purpose. Paul's call by Jesus is a sharp study then in contrasts 
Because as Paul said, he was a blasphemer, a persecutor, a man of violence. That's who Paul was. Yet Jesus gave mercy and a call. Paul acted in unbelief and ignorance while the immortal, invisible, only God acted with grace and patience and love. Jesus called Paul from one state, stopped him, and set him back on a path with him. When we stop, we are not confronted as sinners and made to wallow forever as those who have denied the glory and honor due to God. Stopping reminds us that we are not lost in hopelessness, but delivered by Jesus himself. When we stop, we are faced not with despair, but when we're stopped by Jesus, we're stopped and faced with love. When we stop, we consciously make a radical decision not to be defined by our work. When we stop, we are defined by God's love. When we stop, we risk seeing that some of what we thought was worthwhile and important is hollow and vacuous, while love awaits to reorient our lives with Jesus. Because when we stop, we can fully listen to God, we pay attention to following Jesus, we adjust our view and our tempo with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Stopping allows us to remove those lies and to follow Jesus. We don't have to wait for a sabbatical to stop. We don't have to wait for a vacation to reclaim our lives in God because when we stop, it could be on a Sabbath, it can be in worship, it can be on a time away. We may find when we risk stopping that there's overwhelming beauty, joy, hope, and mercy surrounding us. For instance, in 2019, I actually applied for a Lilly Grant to help fund my sabbatical. At that time, if you remember, it was about, I had been here about 10 years, which is time for a sabbatical. I applied to a Lilly Grant for this. Pastors can apply for that. And I didn't receive the grant, mainly because, in all honesty, uh, the grant wants you to plan out your whole sabbatical, and I couldn't justify sitting in my recliner watching movies as what the grant would help with. That's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to, like, lay in bed and watch movies for my sabbatical. And the grant was like, no, you need to do things. I'm like, but I don't stop then. And, you know. But you know what? This sabbatical, which was at the time, you know, obviously we had the pandemic. We have all this. Well, we still have the pandemic. We have all these things going on. Stopping this summer made me confront how tired I was. Stopping showed me how I needed to let um, the, our pandemic, the worries of the world, and the stress of life recede a little bit. Stopping reminded me I could not control everything that I wanted to control. And it, and it made me put who I was a little bit more in perspective. For instance, people ask me why I got into the ministry. It's because Jesus called me. It wasn't because I'm any good or better. Jesus called me. Jesus is the one that I follow. It's the one that we follow. And Jesus loves me. Jesus was not asking me to be all that I could be for anyone else, just for him. In Jesus, I am loved and I am able to love others. When we stop, we hear Jesus calling us. Jesus is the one that we follow. Jesus loves us. Jesus is asking us to be who we are, not someone else, just be who we are. In Jesus, we are loved and able to love others. So here's a second story. I told some people about this, but I was blessed to be able to go to the International Civil Rights Center and Museum in the original Woolworths in Greensboro, North Carolina. Now, this is where the first sit-in took place in the civil rights movement on February 1960. And the original full-scale lunch counter is still there. It's actually on the second floor. It, it was mind-boggling to me because they think, like, a lunch counter is on the first floor. But in a lot of stores, you know, they want people to come in. And then if you want to eat, it's on the second floor. And this was very strategic in the sit-in movement. And, and I was already, by this time in my vacation, I was in full flip-flop mode. 
trying to calm down, trying to stop. You can't run when you're in flip-flops, just to let you know, or it's really difficult. I was also in the South, which is a lot more chill, right? And I'm not sure why this happened, but as I was getting closer to this museum, I was totally stressed out because I was running late. Now, I had a ticket for a one o'clock tour of the museum, and the drive from DC, where Alexandria, Virginia, where I was with one friend, to Greensboro was taking a little bit longer than I had thought. And I read in the guidebook about Dame's Chicken and Waffles, which is a great place for chicken and waffles. And I was like, I want to go to Greensboro, get there early, eat chicken and waffles, and then go to my tour. But this drive was taking a lot longer than I thought. So did I stop to think about this? No, I didn't. I got to the restaurant at 12.30, with a one o'clock appointment for a tour. And because of who I am and because of my sort of my personality, I gotta be on time, I rushed into the restaurant, I ordered. And when the chicken and waffles arrived, much to the shock of my nice waitress, and I'm sure the whole staff was wondering about this Western boy who was eating there, I handed her my payment and in three minutes ate the entire plate of chicken and waffles. Now, that's not completely uncharacteristic out of me. I can eat real fast when I want to. But I mean, this was really good chicken and waffles. And I ate it in three minutes or less. And from there, I rushed to get parking close to the museum, which meant that, of course, there was a brief southern downpour of two blocks. And southern rain is like really thick. It's not like Washington rain. So I was soaking as I entered the museum at 1.08 PM. So the thing about it is I ate chicken and waffles, which took some time to prepare, which is wonderful. I ate it in three minutes, got there, was soaking drenched at 108, thinking, Whew, I'm not too late for my one o'clock appointment. And I walked into this lobby and I apologized for being late and asked how I could catch up with my tour group. And these nice people at the front desk looked at me like I was crazy. And they said, well, your ticket, it's from one to four o'clock. It just, helps, it just helps space out groups who come to the museum. You bought the afternoon ticket. You have until 4 o'clock. <laughs> and they looked at me and they said, you can head on down to the basement for the beginning of the tour where you watch a movie about the history of the museum and the civil rights movement. And then you follow the rest of the museum through the exhibits to the second floor where the lunch counter is. Have a great time visiting, and please ask any museum staff if you have any questions. Yeah, I didn't stop at all. <laughs> As Paul writes, the saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Because guess what? I just put my head down, and I missed out on some really good food. Paul writes, for that very reason, I received mercy and I would add, so that even as my stomach hurt during the tour as the chicken and waffles needed time to settle, Jesus displayed the utmost patience, reminding me of his call, his redemption of my life, and his ability to help me stop and seek him alone, even as I rushed to get to this museum. The truth is God loves us completely, fully, without fail, as we are right now, the good news is Jesus loves us gracefully and powerfully as we are right now. The amazing invitation for us today is the Holy Spirit is love for us, within us, and open to guiding us freely as we are right now. As Paul ends his pericope there in 1 Timothy to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the God, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. All we need to do is stop. Amen. I debated whether or not to add this next part of our worship to the, the call of confession. Um, but uh, 
only because while this references 9-11 and a litany of remembering, and we will honor 9-11, um, this litany also helps us to remember and, and acknowledge a lot of the suffering and the pain that has gone on well beyond 9-11 and unfortunately sticks with us at times and will stick with us as the human condition. But I hope as we take this time to uh, do this litany together before we close with a hymn and benediction, that we are reminded of God's providence and grace and love during any time of our lives. So today we pray with remembrance of tragedy in our minds, with sorrow in our hearts, with longing in our souls. Together let us pray for the victims of terrorism, war, and violence everywhere. In your great mercy, grant them the peace that the world has denied them. For the men and women who answered their nation's call to serve, for soldiers, firefighters, police officers, and all public servants, protect them by your grace and bring them whole, out of harm's way, back into the safety of their loved ones for the innocent lives caught in the crossfire, who have died, been maimed, and lost both home and homeland. For those that mourn, weep, and live in fear amidst wars they do not fight, grant them comfort from sadness, protection in danger, and the relief of daily bread and basic necessities of human life as they rebuild their lives. For the families and individuals broken by the physical and psychological effects of war, violence, and terrorism. For those suffering from long separation, fragmented relationships, missing limbs, and mental illness, grant them the strength and aid they need to be complete, at peace, and restored to life. For the children who have been made orphans, the women who have been made widows, the men who have been made widowers, and the parents who have, been, who have buried children. For those that weep this day and forever for their departed loved ones, transform mourning into dancing and surround them with a great cloud of witnesses for comfort and support. For the young who have never known a time when America or our world was not at war with them or with others, for those who taught to fragment the human family into categories of us and them, for those raised to justify anonymity towards others by believing that God hates those that would harm them or disagree with them, have mercy on them through the revelation of your divine, all-encompassing love. For all the men, women, and children who have lost the ability to forgive. For us and them in every war, teach all as you have commanded to forgive 70 times seven, even those that would cause us and our loved ones harm. O oh God, who made us in your image, who comforts and weeps with us, create in us a spirit to respond to pain with compassion, Enlarge our hearts so that we may weave hope from the torn fabric of tragedies. Grant us strength and courage to offer forgiveness to all as you have so graciously forgiven us. In our pain, may we not forge swords but plowshares. In tragedy, may we not despair but through your spirit create good news, hope, and peace for a broken world. In the name of your Son, our Savior, who has commanded us to forgive in the affinity of his love for us, we pray this. Amen.
Friends, let's go from here. Let's go from here, risk knowing that we can stop. Stop to know that Jesus has called us, that God loves us, and the Holy Spirit is grace always towards us. So let's go in the love of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Be with us, guide us, strengthen us as we leave here today. Amen. Amen.